You know, as we're putting the summit line up together, we always want to make it just a great summit to honor your time, to honor your investment. But we always take a look at the feedback in regards to what speakers did you really enjoy? Which ones really made an impact on you? It's very rare that we invite somebody back the very next year to speak again. But last year, there was a guy that came up here and he spoke from a medical background, medical expertise, so that you could not deny the science on that little girl in her mother's womb. She has a separate DNA and she is a baby. And so what we did is we invited, invited Dr. Bill Lyle, America's pro-life doc back. He's got plenty of energy. Talk about caffeine. He's got caffeine. Welcome, Dr. Bill Lyle. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's good to be back here. We've got a surprise for you. This is Dean Vanderplatz. Dean Vanderplatz, who's the dean of the Let's see if we can get it to go up. No, we're going to get it. The Family Leader School of Medicine. So I spoke with Dean Vanderplatz, and you all have been accepted to the Family Leader School of Medicine. When we go to medical school, and I practice obstetrics and gynecology, I've delivered 4,000 babies, and it is the love of my life but I love being right here. I know that when I am standing here talking about the right to life and my patients in the womb, this is exactly where God wants me to be, right here in this little square. And I thank you for being here today. So you're in medical school now. Call your moms and say, Mom, I'm in medical school. You made it. All right, so the first thing we do is we start to teach in Latin, not Latin dancing. All right, we're gonna teach you Latin language. And the first word we're gonna learn is Primum, so say that. Primum. All right, no, you got to do the hand. It works better with the hand. All together. Primum. All right. Primum non. Primum non. All right, one more word, you got it. Primum non nocere. What does that mean? What did you just say in Latin? First, do no harm. Do no harm like we do not give hormone blockers to little kids who are confused. The second thing we learn after prima non nocere is how we treat the preborn as patients. Patients have rights. More than half of the states now have patients' bills of rights. Even as liberal as New York State is, they have 22 separate rights that they list. Are These are for all patients. Patients, if you look carefully, you can say that regardless of age, patients have the right, regardless of race, color, religion, or sex, to a clean and safe environment. If they are a patient, they are a person. The rights come from God. It is the duty of good government to defend those rights which come from God. I was at the University of Florida College of Medicine. I was talking to the students, and I said, if I have a patient in the emergency room that needs a blood transfusion, or if I have a patient in the emergency room that needs open heart surgery or laser vascular surgery, but they weren't born in the United States, do I still need to provide them with care? One of the medical students stood up and says, Dr. Lyle, we've been taught here at the University of Florida College of Medicine that a patient is a person is entitled to respect and bodily integrity. I said, I was taught the same thing when I was here. And I'll tell you that every one of those patients I just described received the care that they needed, even though they weren't born in the United States, yet. And that is the key. We are treating the babies in the womb as patients. And now you're going to medical school. We're going to go into the operating room. We're going to go into labor and delivery. The first thing we're going to learn is something called a pubs. How many of you like to go to pubs? OK, I see the heads nodding. The, the Baptists are like, no, not really. You know? <laughs> but pubs, what is a pubs? A pubs is a peri-umbilical blood sampling. From the moment of conception, the mother and the baby are different individuals. In fact, the baby can have a different blood type from the mother. Their blood does not mix. And sometimes the mothers will have antibodies which will cross the placenta and start to attack the baby's blood. The baby's blood count starts to go down. And we can see this on ultrasound. If we have a patient that is having a decreased blood count, we have two choices. We can either deliver that baby and then give the baby blood, 
or we can give that baby a blood transfusion in the womb. We have given babies blood transfusions in the womb as early as 18 weeks gestation. They can't survive on the outside for another seven weeks, yet we can guide a needle through the skin to the umbilical cord with blood that one of you donated that had O negative blood. We transfuse that blood into the umbilical vein of the baby and we save that baby's life. So if this is the baby, you can see the big umbilical cord there. We would guide a needle right into that umbilical umbilical cord right there and give that baby a life-saving blood transfusion. Sometimes we have to do this every three or four weeks because the mom's antibodies still keep attacking the baby's blood. If we can give a baby in the womb a blood transfusion to save its life, is that a patient? Yeah, and a patient is a person no matter how small and patients have rights. Now I'm going to show you something called twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Remember the uh, movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito twins, all right? This is what was going on. You see one big baby and one little baby. Why is one little? Because they are sharing one placenta because they are identical twins, yet they are not sharing equally. So when we have patients like this, what do we do? Do we send them to finishing school so they learn how to share? Yeah, we send them to Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. They teach them how to share in the womb. How do you teach a baby how to share? They will go inside the womb with the laser and they will take that laser and they will just divide the placenta in two. I'm gonna show you a brand new animation. It costs us thousands of dollars to do just for this event. This is the world premiere. The view that you are going to see is what it would look like if the GoPro was already inside of the womb with these babies on the inside. So this is a pro-life doc video. Remember, we need to do laser to divide the placenta in two. Starts out kind of dark there on the inside because there, aren't, there isn't much lighting on the inside. See the little white spot? That's the camera and the instrument coming in from the inside. And the kids are like, well, I knew you were there, but I didn't know you were so good looking, you know? Identical twins. So now the camera comes in, and the kids are looking at it. For the first time they see light, now the surgeon is going to use a laser. Just like Luke Skywalker, he's going to use that laser and divide the placenta in two. We send these babies down to Texas Children's Hospital. They might be at the 99th and 1st percentile. Ten days later, they send, us, send them back to Pensacola. By the time they deliver, weeks and weeks and weeks, Weeks later, they might be at the 60th and the 40th percentile. We are teaching these babies how to share in the womb. If we are doing laser surgery and teaching them how to share nutrition, are they patients? Yeah, and patients have rights. A patient is a person, no matter how small. But is that all we're doing? Who remembers this picture? Yeah, I'll make you feel old. You know how long ago that was? 24 years is when that was done. This is a baby that had a defect in his spine called spina bifida. Vanderbilt University was doing a trial where they were opening up the uterus and actually repairing the defect on the inside. Not because it was cool to do, they now know that these babies have better outcomes. When you follow them for 10 years, they can walk better, they can go upstairs, downstairs, have better control of their bladders and bowels. When we take the initiative to treat them as patients on the inside, we have improved their quality of life for the rest of their lives. But then was that it? No. Because look, that's that baby in the womb, that's Samuel Armas with me up at Georgia Right to Life, and that's Samuel Armas now. Is he a patient on the left? Yeah. Is he a patient in the middle? Yeah. Is he a patient on the right in his mother's womb? Absolutely. And a patient has rights, and a patient is a person, no matter how small. That was generation one. So if you have a gen one, what else do you have? You got a generation two. We are now doing this surgery laparoscopically or fetoscopically, where we are going into the womb and we are actually taking cameras and instruments. We are repairing defects in these babies' spines and doing the same kind of care that they would get outside the womb, but we are getting better outcomes. If we can give a view like that and then do surgery on these babies' spines and cure them, is that a patient? Yes. And remember, more than half of the states have patients' bill of rights. A patient is a person, no matter how small. Well, if you have a Gen 1 and a Gen 2, what do you think is next? Gen 4. Gen 4 is now already happening over at UC Davis. This is Dr. Diane Farmer. She's going into the womb. She is applying stem cells, not from aborted babies. She's applying stem cells on a little patch that were harvested from placentas after a healthy baby is already delivered. She applies these stem cells. Stem cells are what we call toady potential cells. They're like a five-year-old. What's a five-year-old going to be when they grow up? 
Who knows? They just need guidance and direction. Same thing with the stem cell. What is it going to be when it matures and grows up? It can be whatever it gets guidance towards. These stem cells apply to the defect on the spine and say, oh, now I know what I'm supposed to do. Now I know who I'm supposed to be. And they become spinal tissue. It's called the cure trial. Not just the treatment. They are really looking at this being a cure for the 2,000 babies each year that are diagnosed with spina bifida. But as it get cooler, it gets cooler, y'all. We're going to do open heart surgery on a baby. This baby was diagnosed with a teratoma. What's a teratoma? Y'all are in medical school. You're learning new terms. It's a benign tumor is a teratoma. But look, you're not an expert in, in ultrasound, but I'm going to help you out. Whenever you see a big sign like that, a big magnifying glass, that's your hint. The heart is just down below it. You can see the lung on the right, and you can see the lung on the left. That tumor right there in the magnifying glass is the teratoma. It is growing so quickly that it is going to kill this baby in the womb. Parents were given two options. We can deliver this baby at 27 weeks, do the open heart surgery, and see how the baby does in the NICU. Or we can do surgery while that baby is still inside of the womb. They opted to do surgery on this baby while it was st still inside of the womb and remove that life-threatening tumor. I'm gonna show you a video, and the thing I want you to remember about this, it's amazing to see mom had an epidural. She's comfortable, just like a mom who's delivering a baby. Mom is comfortable. But because the baby is a different person, once they get inside, the baby is assigned its own anesthesiologist who started an IV in the baby's hand. The baby was receiving a pain medicine in small doses called fentanyl and also receiving a paralytic because you don't want to be doing heart surgery and the baby's moving around like this. When I do a hysterectomy on a patient, the patient gets anesthesia. Do we hire a second anesthesiologist to give the uterus anesthesia? No because the uterus is part of the mom's body. The baby is supported by the mom, but it is not part of the mom's body. So this is how this surgery was performed over at the Cleveland Clinic. There's mom, there's her beautiful baby on the inside, and you can see right there on the baby's heart, you can see that little white thing there on the top. That is the teratoma. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit closer, and this is the tumor that is going to kill this baby. That little white glob is growing faster than the baby's heart. Mom has an epidural, she's comfortable. The gynecologist comes in, makes an incision, makes an incision in the uterus and they go tag. They go tag and a different surgical team comes in. The anesthesiologist comes in, takes out one arm, takes out the second arm, starts an IV, gives the baby medication so the baby is comfortable. They go tag. Now the cardiothoracic team comes in. They open up the baby's chest, they remove that big tumor from the baby's chest near the heart. They then remove it, they see that the heart is beating normally almost immediately. They then close the baby's chest, disconnect the IV, close the uterus, and then close the skin. That was 27 weeks gestation. When did that baby deliver? 10 weeks later. If we can do open heart surgery and save the life of the baby with a separate anesthesiologist, is that a patient? Yeah. And a patient is a person no matter how small. Patients' bills of rights. This is how one way we can defend God's pre-born in the womb. This is a picture of the actual surgical team. You have 25 doctors, nurses, and techs working to make sure that the mom is healthy and the baby is healthy. You had two people with heartbeats walk into the operating room, and you had two people with heartbeats walk out of the operating room. What happens with abortion? Surgical abortion, two heartbeats walk into the room, and one heartbeat walks out of the room. If half of your patients are dying and losing their heartbeats, that is not health care. This is health care at the highest level. I told you they started an IV in that baby's hand, right? That is that exact baby and that is that IV that they were giving fluids, pain medication, and a paralytic to. Is that a patient? That is as clear as it can be that this is a patient and patients have rights. That is that baby. That baby turned two years of age yesterday. But this is the patient that was there on the inside. His name is Rylan. And you think, oh, it can't get cooler than that. It keeps advancing. That's what medicine does. Four weeks ago, Children's Hospital of Boston had a baby that was diagnosed with a Galen malformation in the brain. 
A Galen malformation is when there's a connection between a high pressure artery and a low pressure vein. And it would be like blowing up your kid's balloon but using the pressure washer instead. And what happens is the vein starts to just get distended and growing. Well, half of these kids diagnosed with this get really sick. And right after delivery, those kids that get sick, half of these kids die. And you're saying, well, there's no way they operate on these babies on the inside to correct the problem with the brain. They did for the first time. So they identified this Galen malformation. They said, you know what? That black thing, that is not what we want. That is the vein just swelling to the point where it's getting ready to blow. So they, while the baby was inside the womb, they gave a little trocar that went through the mom's skin, the wall of the uterus, through the fluid. They went right up to the back of the baby's head. And then they introduced an instrument. They got it into where this connection was. And they obliterated it. And all of a sudden, this baby was delivered later and the baby is doing great. If we can do vascular brain surgery on a baby inside the womb, are they a patient? Yeah, and a patient is a person no matter how small. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN here today. I love Dr. Gupta. Dr. Gupta is a great communicator and a smart guy. He actually did a story on this Galen malformation surgery because in the medical community, this is pretty amazing. I want you to listen to the audio of him describing this surgery. In utero surgery also means they had to take two patients to the operating room instead of... Boy, did you hear that? What did he say? Let's do it one more time. A little more volume. In utero surgery also means they had to take two patients to the operating room instead of one. Two and patients. We just discussed patient's bills of rights, how a patient is a person no matter how small. Dr. Sanjay Gupta from, what is it? Is it the Christian News Network or the conservative news network? No, it's CNN. He is acknowledging that mom is a patient and the baby is a patient. Patients have rights. They are creating the image of God. So it's not just a patient's bill of rights, it's two patients' bills of rights. And if it was twins, it's three. And I've delivered triplets and quads. Now I've got five patients in there. And quads are cool. You feel like a magician just pulling rabbits out of the hat, just one after the other. That is baby Denver. Baby Denver had brain surgery inside the womb, and baby Denver is now doing very well. So here's the question. Is it a choice, or are we engaged in the greatest spiritual battle that this nation has had in the last 100 years? This is a spiritual battle. Genesis 1:26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Nothing else in the amazing creation of God was created in his image. We're not created in the image of God the day we are born. We are created in the image of God at that moment of conception. Abortion at its absolutely foundation is an attack against that image of God. Have you ever seen somebody burn the American flag? Why does somebody burn the American flag? because the American flag represents the image of the United States. If somebody hates the United States and what it stands for, they want to attack and destroy the image that represents the United States. Abortion is an attack on the image of God based on a hatred for God himself. Psalm 139, the psalmist is talking to God and he goes, God, you formed my inmost being, you knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. We didn't just evolve, we were created by the Almighty God. It is amazing how he created us. Little more scripture, Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us all so much that he sent his son, he lived a perfect life, he gave his life for us, then he conquered death three days later just for us. Well, when it comes to Romans 5.8, I mean, besides my wife and I, and maybe Bob Vanderplatz, any other sinners in the room? <laughs> I, I, I got one who almost raised her hand. Yeah, we're, y'all are really good, you know? But no, we are all sinners. When were you a sinner? Do you remember your first sin? Well, let's go to the Psalm. Psalm 51.5 says that surely I was sinful at birth. Heck, I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We were conceived with the sin nature. If God loves the preborn, the little sinners in the womb so much that he would send his son, give his life, and then conquer death for all of us, including the preborn, do the preborn desert all of our efforts to defend their lives? Absolutely. 
Can we win? Oh my goodness, y'all, we are winning. Did you see what happened over here at this table today? This was like the Declaration of Independence being signed. I mean, this is an amazing feat. I mean, here you have Governor Reynolds. And if you don't know, my middle name is Reynolds, William Reynolds Lyle. So Governor Reynolds, I know we've got to be relatives. They passed the heartbeat bill before, and she signed it into law. And then the, the Supreme Court here said, no. What did she say? She came right up to them. She says, are you talking to me? Are, uh, are you talking to me? And what did she do on Tuesday? She brought back members of the House and the Senate. They worked through the night. They passed the bill. And you saw her just sign that. Are we able to win? We are winning. I was speaking at the uh, Capitol in Tallahassee in Florida. There's some guy from Florida who's here a little bit later on today. You know? But I was there. We spoke. And we talked about things just like we're talking about today. Later that night, the House voted to pass a heartbeat bill. Three years ago, abortion was capped at 24 weeks gestation. Then we dropped it down to 15 weeks gestation. Now we, too, have a heartbeat bill. So can we win? Yes, we can. There is no doubt. What are the tools that we use? I mean, obviously, we use the legislative tool because it's a powerful tool. We can use science and we can use medicine. We can take you and to medical school. We can teach you Latin and show you how we treat the preborn as patients and that a patient is a person, no matter how small. What's our most powerful tool? Our most powerful tool is the gospel. It is the gospel that changes hearts. It is the gospel that changes minds. It is the gospel that changes behavior. We refer to the first four books in the New Testament as the gospel message. But what is book number five? Not just Acts. It is the Acts of the Apostle. Action. It wasn't just the hangout of the Apostles. It wasn't just the whining of the Apostles. It was the Acts of the Apostles. When we combine the power of the Gospel with action, we will win. We will save the lives of God's preborn, and we will save this grand nation that we live in. God bless you all. It is a privilege to be able to be here because God bless you. God bless the United States. Thank you very much.